It really is a pleasure to be in Washington, D.C. Our very first IIIF event that was an outreach event happened at the National Gallery of Art five years ago, and it's great to see how much the community has grown and also the auditorium. Uh, while the NGA was, was a lovely room, we have a little bit more breathing space in here. Um, as Kate Rue is really emphasizing the, the nature of IIIF and the need to invest in community, and uh, as part of that, it's a very, I'm going to give you a warning, this is the audience participation part, or the first audience participation part. I'd like to ask anyone who's been to a IIIF event before or who considers themselves a IIIF veteran, if you could just raise your hand. All right, so we have about 20%, 25% of the room. Now, a key part of IIIF has been the ability, as Kate was highlighting, to be able to work together to understand what our common needs and opportunities are around delivering using um, enriched digital resources. And part of that is to actually consult with each other. So as part of this, uh, you all came here for a reason today. One of the big reasons that we run these events is to meet more people. And I'd like you to just take a second and look to the person to your left or to your right and introduce yourself. Uh, say what institution you're from. <laughs> yes, you all sat together, so it's... <laughs> all right. I can already tell this is going to be a lively crowd. This is going to be the best uh, IIIF showcase event that we've had. Okay, Adam, Adam, Adam Weed. Adam Weed crossed 12 seats to meet, make a connection with a neighbor. Thank you, Adam. That's the leadership that we love and embrace. Um, a big part of being a community-based initiative is also providing an inclusive, uh, welcoming, and safe environment. Um, throughout today, IIIF prides itself on having a code of conduct, conduct which is listed on the uh, website. Uh, we also today, if anyone has a need or needs some sort of support, uh, could we have a member of the code and safety team, or could we have the code and safety team members stand up? Uh, several of whom are here. You can recognize them by their distinctive lanyards, which are uh, blue and white racing striped. Thank you, code, uh, code of Conduct and Safety Team members. Another part of today on a logistical note before we start is we will be having two birds of a feather lunches today. So assuming a lack of rain, um, we will have a group of people who are interested in software development gathering together around Drew Winget. Uh, Drew is in the auditorium, or he may be working on software development right now. Um, and we also have Ben Albritton and uh, Anna um, Narutamoya, who will be leading a discussion around archives and manuscripts. Um, ben and Anna, if you can stand up. We have Ben up front and Anna in the back. Uh, so if you are interested in archives and manuscripts, please cluster with um, uh, Ben and Anna. And if you are interested in software development, you will find Drew because he'll probably have a laptop. Okay, so. Um, Triple IF, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, we say Triple IF because International Image Interoperability Framework is a mouthful, but each term has a distinct and important term. So international is global, and in a second you'll see exactly what that means. When we say image, we don't just mean flat images, we mean image-based digital resources. So uh, books, images, manuscripts, newspapers, musical scores, uh, and in, even now audiovisual materials um, are what we consider digital objects and digital resources that we deliver. By interoperability, we mean mutually usable or simpatico, the ability to work together without having to have a deep understanding relationship or a lot of engineering. And when we talk about framework, we mean a, a concordance of four uh, complementary um, notions. So application programming interfaces, or APIs, software that understands those APIs, uh, a, a large amounts and growing amount of digital content, which is accessible through that software and through those APIs, and most importantly, a community who is bringing it all together. And the the original inspiration behind IIIF was realizing that images are fundamental information carriers on the internet. They are the way we consume, other than text, it is probably the largest and most predominant form of conveying information on the web. 
Um, but image delivery on the web, and certainly 10 years ago when the seeds of IIIF were laid, and I think still today, um, is suboptimal on the web. Uh, it's, if you're providing it, it can be hard. Images, image delivery can be slow. Uh, it is expensive to provision and to maintain these environments. Um, the experience is often disjointed for uh, users and researchers moving across multiple different sites. Uh, and the content is often locked up. And effectively, image delivery on the internet is siloed. So um, this is a wonderful picture of grain silos from Idaho. And I like to think, especially for the cultural heritage sector, we like to uh, promote our resources. We like to make them available. 30 images per second from Library of Congress, 30 new images per second is a fantastic way to actually deliver on the value of the library collections. And we expose them and we say that we cooperate, but in reality, they tend to be locked up and users have to walk across a very narrow silo across the top of our content and technology. So what if there were a better way to deliver our images? And thanks to IIIF, these are actually all uh, live demos. Um, well, these are not live demos because we had internet trouble, but we've learned because we've been doing this for a number of years. Um, one of the key things that uh, is of interest on the internet is to be able to deliver very large images with very deep zoom. This is an example of a Japanese tax map from the 19th century that was uh, digitized at Stanford. Uh, it is a gigapixel image. Uh, and this is, with IIIF, this is now standard capability of our digital library and also many other digital libraries. Our lead photographer at Stanford is Wayne Vanderkill. Wayne is six foot four, and this map is about two Waynes by three Waynes wide. <laughs> 10 years ago, we could not have delivered this image on the web. You would have had to call us and we would have had to ship you a hard drive or arrange for some type of FTP. Now it's uh, standard functionality. Um, what about the ability not just to consume an entire image, but a region of interest of the image? How would you be able to cite that, to share that, uh, and to come back to that? This is an example from University of College Dublin, which has used IIIF to do an image crop tool. Uh, and in this case, you can highlight a region of interest. Um, you can actually save this as an individually addressable resource, which can be cited in a scholarly publication or shared with collaborators. Um, and you can actually propagate that around the web, not just as an image file, but as a, a distinct digital object. Uh, the ability to compare is a fundamental scholarly and research uh, function. Uh, using IIIF, these two CT scans of the head of a, of a seal can be compared from the, this is from the Wellcome Trust collection, to completely flat um, environments. And uh, we're able to actually look at two images side by side and carry them forward. Um, what if you want to compare images that aren't on the same site? IIIF also enables this. This is an example from the Digital Bodleian uh, with a portraiture. And on the right, we have an example of William Shakespeare, a, a print or an etching from Stanford's collections. If I were a scholar studying Shakespeare portraiture, I wouldn't be able to not just open up two windows side by side, but actually uh, compare these two items in the, same, uh, in the same online browsing environment, in this case, the digital, digital tool Mirador. On top of that, I might say that the Yale Center for British Art also has some uh, Shakespearean portraiture. And by bringing, I can move all three things into the same analytic environment, and I can not only view them, but I can manipulate them, zooming in, rotating, and highlighting regions of interest. Uh, there are other examples of things that which belong together logically or one time uh, belong together physically. Our colleagues at Biblissima, which is a, a project out of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, uh, often deals with objects such as this, where people have extracted particularly interesting things and made them separate physical objects. Uh, using the power of IIIF, um, uh, the Biblissima team has actually managed to reunite these two physical objects, which were digitized and held by separate cultural heritage institutions in France. Both are available on their servers, but make less sense individually than they do in context. With IIIF, they're dynamically rendered and joined together without actually having to exchange image files. Uh, what if you have full text and would like to be able to search, annotate, or uh, do optical character recognition correction? What if you have uh, maps and you would like to be able to render those geospatially and do geolocation and georeferencing, turning maps into uh, computable, individually computable objects? 
what if uh, you wanted to have a uh, annotation and work on scientific imagery? This is an example from Harvard University's um, edX platform where they're uh, delivering content on the, uh, the innards of a cell. So they've produced this extremely high resolution uh, image of cellular parts and using IIIF and annotation. They're highlighting regions of interest and allowing students to drill down into particular areas of the cell, understand the nature and the function of the cellular components. Uh, you can also do things like crowdsourcing images from uh, this example from the National Library of Wales. Uh, or you can enrich physical objects by adding a digital companion, allowing close inspection of things which are otherwise inaccessible. Um, and finally, one of the great powers of IIIF, enabled by its APIs, is the ability to use any software of choice. This is from the Qatar Digital Library, which was prepared by uh, commercial vendor Cogapp, and they've done their own uh, rich front-end delivery of archival materials that has been digitized, and they've also put up a demonstration of delivering the exact same object through three other viewers simultaneously, in this case, Mirador, the Universal Viewer, and the Internet Archives Book Reader. So, it's impressive stuff, and it's certainly in advance from where we were five or ten years ago. How does IIIF actually work? Um, and again, the key that I mentioned is this notion of APIs. In a world without APIs, we have this, these silos, uh, content and technology uh, silos, where every application has to be custom built to be grafted on a back end. Uh, every database is able to present its contents to the internet, but only to the front end, and users have to navigate across many different interfaces and content databases. Um, this is where APIs come in. So last year at this event, we were at the Vatican, and it was inspirational for a variety of reasons. What I took particular heart about was the illustration of APIs, which are a structured way for systems to interact. Um, and given APIs, if you have a standard API, you're actually able to swap uh, any given front end with a different back end, or any different back end with the same front end, or two completely different systems because they all have the same way of talking to each other. And this is the power of IIIF. By exposing uh, content and functionality through a standard set of APIs, you're able to have one single content store with the application of choice, and if every system and every silo ha observes the same set of APIs, you get this rich ecosystem where you're able to mix and match not only content, but application functionality. So the vision for IIIF and, uh, is exactly this, uh, to create a global framework uh, by which image-based digital resources can be delivered from any participating institution using any back-end technology for display manipulation and annotation in any front-end application to any user on the web. And further, that this is a, an ecosystem which has tens of millions of digital objects in it, um, backed by a world-leading consortium or a consortium of world-leading institutions with a rich and growing suite of software tools using the best of web standards and uh, current image delivery technology. And that's, I think, what we've accomplished so far and what we're still in the process of. So IIIF, I mentioned the framework, has four components. There's uh, community, the APIs, software, and content. So I'll walk through each one briefly. So for the community, there are more than 100 institutions worldwide. And in fact, if you are using IIIF but not yet known to us, like the US, historical, um, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, which I learned in the lobby today, we would like to hear because we would like to represent your institution on this map. Um, these are, there are more than 100 institutions worldwide, including more than 20 uh, national and state libraries, a growing number of blue chip institutions, leading content aggregators such as Artstore, DPLA, Europeana, um, uh, ContentDM, and some university and research institutions that you'll be familiar with. Uh, it is these institutions through, through, through their staffing, exposing their content, and uh, alt updating their content or their technology infrastructure are providing the backbone for IIIF. IIIF is also not just the institutions, though. It is the individuals like those in this room. This is why we emphasize the personal connection. In your institution, if you have needs or if you are an expert in a particular facet of uh, digital image delivery, whether that's on the technology side, the curation side, or, or the use side, you have a role in this community. 
the APIs are the fundamental backbone of IIIF, and the way IIIF has taken off so far is because it is not overly opinionated about either the way you store your content or what technology you're using as long as you understand that contract of the APIs. There are two fundamental APIs. One is the image API, which delivers pixels to a remote screen, and the other is a presentation API, which lets you represent a digital object in a way that a remote viewer can understand. Now, it's important to recognize, especially those from a, a library, archive, or museum background, we're not talking about another metadata standard that you have to adopt and move to. Uh, we didn't have enough time. There are librarians, and archives, and museum people in this room. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the image API is something where, through a simple manipulation of uh, a URL, you're able to take a given image, extract a region of interest, uh, resize it, uh, rotate it, uh, and do different types of uh, different delivery surrogates just through parameters based in the URL. And as we were re originally concocting IIIF, we figured that this accounted for about 80 to 90 percent of the interactions that people wanted uh, with uh, images on the website. The presentation API gives essential things like properties and structure. So properties, what's the title of a work or a structure in terms of uh, if it's a book, which page precedes and which page succeeds a given image. And if you put the two things together, uh, you can see that the presentation API gives you the things that are in red. So things like the title, the table of contents, and the structure of the thumbnails across the bottom while the blue gives you the images, the pixels, including those of the thumbnails. Uh, there are two additional APIs which have subsequently been developed. One is the ability to search within content. So if you have newspaper uh, uh, text or a book, for example, you can search within that. And the other is an authentication API. Not all content is open and freely accessible on the web. The authentication API lets an institution present uh, some sort of login for differential access to materials while still accruing the benefits of interoperability. In terms of software, this is, I think, the most exciting development in IIIF in the last two to three years. Uh, we were originally counting all of the compatible software and writing most of the compatible software ourselves. Um, as of the turn of the year, there are now scores of software applications, including many industry standard uh, and commercial applications that are IIIF compliant. And that is both uh, digital asset management systems, it's individual image servers, and it's an increasing suite of analytic tools uh, and image viewers, uh, many of which you'll see later today in demonstrations. Um, and again, it's important to recognize that because IIIF is, uh, observes these APIs, it lets you pick the software, whether that's front end or back end as part of this ecosystem. Here are just two of the many software titles that are available, both of which have really grown up around IIIF and illustrate some of its best characteristics, the Universal Viewer and Mirador. Another exciting opportunity for IIIF, and one, frankly, that we didn't even conceive of uh, when we started the, the initiative, is the ability to use uh, uh, up-and-coming tools and methodologies such as machine learning and artificial intelligence. So it turns out that IIIF, by providing a standardized interface to get to hundreds of millions or billions of images, is a fantastic tool to apply machine learning to digital resources, as well as to get the outputs back and express them in a standardized way. Um, at Stanford, we had a, a project where we were trying to extract road network data from Rand McNally roadmaps, uh, which was uh, successfully completed last summer, and our engineering team said, hey, this seems like a very generic approach. Could we apply it to other methodologies or other types of content? So in this case, here's a, a papyrus. Uh, it's, uh, they're training the system to look for individual glyphs, and by just training on one, they're able to locate additional glyphs. Uh, we have additional examples of using this in, uh, for other types of cultural heritage materials, but even for scientific materials such as um, uh, blood cells and doing counts of blood cells. Uh, more trivially, but perhaps more fun, does anyone know where Waldo is? Uh, with a training exercise, in fact, he's down there. And I think this is, this is a funny example, but it's also great because, again, through the power of IIIF, we would never have built in the Stanford Digital Library, and I think for many of the other institutions, the ability to find things like Waldo, but using IIIF, someone else can. Um, a community that develops share, shared APIs and uh, uh, develops and applies software and also exposes interoperable content. 
Now we have one of the greatest, uh, most exciting things about IIIF and one of our burgeoning challenges, um, which is we know that there are now more than a billion interoperable images in the world. Uh, last year we ran a survey, we counted 400, it was a voluntary survey, so we had partial response. We had 400,000 respondents. As soon as we closed the survey, we heard that two of the largest providers, the National Library of Norway and the Internet Archive said, oh, we didn't fill out your survey. Well, how many images do you have? Oh, we have like 400,000 or 500,000 each. So we're already over a billion images uh, from 100 different participating institutions. One of the great opportunities we have is to find a better way of surfacing these resources to make the content available uh, to all of the people that might be interested. Um, so IIIF, we have hundreds of adopters. There are scores of software applications and a growing number. We have uh, millions of digital objects and we have revolutionary promise. That's great, how do I get me some of that? Um, if you are not currently using IIIF and you find this intriguing, there are four or five simple ways that you can begin to dip your toes into the water. So first, expose your, if you're an institution, expose your collections via IIIF. This doesn't require brand new infrastructure in most cases, but requires um, providing support for the APIs out of your existing structure. Second, use IIIF compatible software. There's a lot of it out there and it is some of the best of breed material. Third, if you buy your software, ask your vendor or your supplier, your, your commercial partner, to support IIIF compatibility. Uh, fourth, um, you can participate in the IIIF community. Coming to events like this, we had a series of workshops yesterday, we have a three-day conference over the next three days, there's a growing number of regional events. And finally, we would urge you to consider joining the IIIF Consortium, which is a group of about 52 institutions at this point who are providing financial and organizational stewardship for the initiative. You can find out more on the website. Um, some uh, contact information, uh, IIIF Discuss is an email list. Every two weeks we have a bi-weekly call. And again, I'm emphasizing this because IIIF isn't something that is just happening outside. It's a group of people doing it together. So we're gonna see in just a second um, a series of, um, of case studies and demonstration about how IIIF has been applied in many different realms. And I'd ask you to think about as we go through that, what are some of the advantages for using it? I, and I think there are uh, two big things. First, IIIF radically reduces the friction of putting digital resources on the web and delivering them. So you get better, faster, deeper, and cheaper digital image delivery or digital object delivery. You can plug and play software, and because of the APIs, you can publish content once and reuse it often without having to ship copies all over the internet. On the other uh, side is you get dramatically more interaction and much uh, richer capabilities for working with your objects. You can zoom, pan, and manipulate. You can compare, reunite, remix, and overlay materials. You can cite, share, and annotate them. You're not just looking at them anymore, you're interacting with the images. And finally, there are burgeoning new uh, capabilities such as applying machine learning and artificial intelligence. So state-of-the-art functionality, um, it's cheaper even if you don't care about the, uh, the better functionality and the richer interaction. A lot of institutions are implementing IIIF on the back end because they're finding it's a better way to engineer and support their environments. Um, you get the benefits of an international standard with all of the institutions that are uh, falling into line. Um, and you can maximize the, the use, the value, and the impact of your collections uh, without giving that away. And finally, you can join a community of users who are actually bending the technology and bending the environment to meet our needs rather than have them projected upon us. So thank you very much.